Greetings in Jesus' name. I believe you're well, uh, well watched over by the Lord, and we are excited to have a message today. Um, and we continue with our theme, vision, the year of the Lord's kingdom heritage. The year of the Lord's kingdom heritage. Some on title today is Kingdom Habits. Kingdom Habits. We'll be focusing together on Kingdom Habits this Sunday and next Sunday because we need to understand what habits do we need as we are effective in the kingdom of God. For us to have a walk and a talk that aligns with the will of God and the purpose of God, what are some of the habits that we need to develop? Of course, there's a habit of prayer, plan, and praise. And last Sunday, we focused a little more on prayer. But today, we'll go a little deeper on prayer and examine it from a perspective of developing a habit of prayer. Developing a habit of prayer. And also understanding what is it all about habits. What is it all about habits? We begin with a passage of scripture, and we'll be looking at Daniel chapter 6, verses 1 to 12. Daniel 6, verses 1 to 12. Uh, and I read, it pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be over the whole kingdom. And over this, three governors of whom Daniel was one, that the satraps might give account to them so that the king would suffer no loss. Then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him and the king gave thought to setting him over the realm. So the governors and satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom but they could find no charge or fault because he was faithful nor was there any error or fault found in him. Then this man said, we shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. So these governors and satraps thronged before the king and said thus to him, King Darius, live forever. All the governors of the kingdom, the administrators and satraps, the counselors and, the advi and advisors have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whoever petitions any god or man for 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which does not alter. Therefore, King Darius signed the written decree. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home. And in his upper room, with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as was his custom, since early days. Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. And they went before the king and spoke concerning the king's decree. Have you not signed a decree that every man who petitions any god or man within 30 days, except you, um, except you, let's continue verse 13, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. The king answered and said, The thing is true, according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which does not alter. Let us pray. Our heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Your word is life, your word is light. We pray as we engage in your word, as we connect with your word, we will not only hear your word, but we have a clear understanding of what you desire of us as we walk in your way and we live according to your standard. Now, Lord, we thank you for the example of Daniel. Help us to be like Daniel, wherever we are, faultless, dear Jesus. So we thank you, we honor you, we glorify you. Speak to us today with power. In Jesus' name we pray. The word custom has been used. And the word custom is also the same word habit. Uh, it can also be translated as habit. And what is a habit? A habit is defined as a settled or regular tendency or practice, especially one that is hard to give up. A settled a habit is a settled or regular tendency or practice, especially one that is hard to give up. 
Now, when you look at Daniel 6, especially in the beginning verses, we learn that Daniel was, of course we know from scripture that Daniel was among those taken to exile in Babylon. Jeremiah had prophesied, you know, that of course if they he had prophesied about this, that they would be taken to exile. And we all know from scripture that when they would sin and not please God, God, there are times he would allow them to be captured by their enemies. And they would be captives and they'd be exiles. And so we are finding Daniel is actually an exile in Babylon. However, he rises up there and he actually becomes a governor. Now, if you look at the structure of leadership there, we had King Darius as the king. And then we had the governors and then we had the satraps. And the purpose was a king would suffer no loss. This king was very clear about profitability. He was very clear about success. He was very clear about having order. And, and so he wanted to really have a very structured um, uh, system, so to speak. In verse 3, we are finding that Daniel had an excellent spirit. Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and satraps. Meaning, though he was a governor, he was above the governors. Why? He distinguished himself. He had an excellent spirit in him. You see, friends, excellence is so important. And the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. What are we finding here? That the king would only have Daniel under him. All the others would be under Daniel. You know, friends, um, we find... Uh, in Luke 16, uh, the test of faithfulness, that if you are faithful in little, you are also faithful in much. And there's a reward for faithfulness. There's a reward for faithfulness. And so we are finding that Daniel has distinguished himself um, in verse 3, and the king wants to him to, wants to promote him, set him over the whole realm. That's what the king wanted. Now, we also find that, um, you know, the quality he was faithful, and he was faultless. So you can imagine the king who thought, must have thought to himself with this young man here who is faultless. You know, they could not find any charge against him. He was faithful. Friends, I want to tell you, when you find a man of excellence or a lady of excellence, when you find one who is faithful, when you find one who is faultless, we, if we use other words, if you find someone who is reliable, who is dependable, you can give an assignment and their yes is a yes and their no is a no. Let me tell you, my friends, that is person qualifying for promotion. Many people long to be promoted, but they don't have an excellent spirit. They long to be promoted, but they are not faithful. They long to be promoted, but they are not faultless. There's something about dependability and reliability. That if a crisis arises, can I count on you? That's what the king is saying. And we are finding in this scenario here, um, Daniel ticks all the boxes. Daniel tick all the bo ticks all the boxes. But I want you to remember something, friends. Even as we look at the governors and the satraps and the counselors, I want you to notice something. There's a principle here, friends, that success and favor not only attract friends, but also force. Success and favor not only attracts friends, but force also. And we are finding jealousy is starting to get into these people. They are finding that Daniel has favor with the king. He, the king likes him. The king wants to promote him above them. And they are not very happy about this. And so they are looking for a fall. Let's go to verse 4. They are looking for a fall. They are trying to find out what can we find out of this guy. So the governors and satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel. They are trying to find a fault against him concerning the kingdom. But they could find no charge of fault. You see, for you to be found faultless and blameless, that's a beautiful place to be. Because he was faithful. One of the secrets, friends, is faithfulness. Faithfulness has a way of reducing your faults. When you are faithful and diligent in what you do, it will be over time... It will be very hard to find a fault because you are consistent. You can't have faithfulness without having consistency. And when you're consistent and faithful and diligent and dependable, someone will look for the fault, especially in the respective area, and they'll not find it. They'll not find it. That's what they were looking for. Now, I want to tell you, friends, if you look at verse 6, verse 5, 
We are told then these men said, now we're seeing a conspiracy here. They're coming together. They're consulting together. Daniel is not with them. We shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. If someone is seeking for a fault, they will find it. If all you're looking for is a fault in someone, you will find it. You see, Jesus was accused, you know, of many things. He was accused of blasphemy. So if someone is really seeking for something against you, it will, they don't have to work very hard. Because even what you're doing, which is right, they can actually coin it and say it is not right. So they said we shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. But verse 6 shows us as an, as, as a plan of the enemy. So these governors and satraps throng before the king and say thus to him, King Darius, live forever. Now we are finding here that, you see, the devil is very clever. You see, friends, I want to tell you, God uses people willing to obey him to have his will done. God uses people willing to obey him to have his will done. Now listen to this. Satan uses people willing to obey him to have his will done. And here we have a people who are aligning with the will of the enemy and the plan of the enemy. And that's to destroy this man who has the spirit of God in him. And that's Daniel. Now all the governors of the kingdom, verse 7, they're telling, they're telling the king, the administrators and satraps, the counselors and advisors have consulted together. Now, now consulting is very important. Consultations are very important because it means there's a unity of mind and purpose. To establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whoever petitions against God or man for 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. So we are finding here that you cannot worship anyone else except the king. You cannot worship any god except the king. And you see, they are appealing to his insecurity. You see, anytime one is in leadership, you will always have a position. That's expected. Now, when you have a position, there's always a sense of insecurity. And this is common and it's standard across generations. So they appeal to his insecurity. And because they're appealing to his insecurity, they're trying to assure him that if it's not you and you alone, no one else should be prayed to. No one else should be sought. Not a God or man except you. And they're very clever because they're trying also to deal with his ego, really. And of course, when he listens to what they're telling him, they are very willing, he's very willing to sign it. You see, friends, it's election time this year. And you know, and people seeking different positions, and, and there's nothing wrong seeking electoral positions. One of the common words you're going to hear is this. All the people are telling me to buy. Wana niambia nisimame. Si mimi nataka, ni wao wanataka nisimame. Wali nikuja wakaniambia, wanataka mimi nisimame. And, and, and so, there's always an assertion that it's a people who are saying, it's not me, it's a people. It's, so, we get a sense of consultation. Well, yet, you're in that constituency and they've never asked you whether you would like them to stand or buy. Friends, this decree is no prayer offered to other God except the king. And, and he then goes ahead and approves it. He goes ahead and, and, and approves it. Now if you look at verse 9. Verse 9 tells us something very interesting. Therefore King Darius signed the written decree. But you see, if you look at verse 10, there's something about the decrees of, 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 of the passions and the meats. Now, before we go to 10, and one of the things about it is that once it was signed, no one could change it. It had to remain as it is. We find verse 8, now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which does not alter. Now, their laws were very rigid. Once they were written, they had to be followed to the letter. And so they knew very well what they were doing. But I want to tell you, friends, this is the enemy's attack on prayer. Satan knows when you go before the throne of grace and you talk to the king of glory and you call upon him as a son because you're a son of God, as a child of God, who has a relationship with Jesus Christ and Christ is your Lord and king, no one can stop you. Even at this time he knew that as long as this one calls on the living God, 
he will hear him and answer him. So the best way is to close the door. You see, if we use this um, analogy where, uh, you know, a door allows you access to the presence of God, then we can even use prayer as a door. That, that when you pray, then the door, the prayer is the door that then opens and gets you to the presence of God that he may hear what you desire that he may hear your pain, that he may hear your sorrow. And that's what prayer is. So if prayer is a door, if we used that, uh, that illustration of prayer being a door, then is the one who shuts the door, then denies you access to the presence of God. And Satan knew, if I can just block that for 30 days, I'll have wrecked enough damage. But let's look at this young man called Daniel. And I want you to notice that uh, verse 10 tells us something very interesting. Now, while Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home and in his upper room, listen to this, with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as was his custom since early days. It was his habit since early days. Daniel had a habit of prayer. The king has just decreed you don't pray, but the habit was in him. He couldn't help himself. He went down on his knee. He went down and knelt down on his knees three times that day. He didn't stop doing it. And guess what? It was his habit from early days. He did not pray because the king had decreed. He had always prayed. He had a habit. You see, friends, your habit will find you. <clears throat> and in this time we are finding his habit found him. You see, they reported him to the king. And we're told later on in verse 18, he was sent to the den of lions. His habit found him. But his habit also rescued him. We find that there's a principle here that we first form a habit. Later, the habit forms us. We first form a habit. We begin forming a habit ourselves. And that's where we begin. That's a principle. But later, the habit forms us. You see, we are told that sociology is saying 90% of what we do um, is based on habits. It's based on habits. 90% of what we do is based on habits. Now, let's take an example uh, right now. You're watching uh, this message right now. <clears throat> and... If it's not your first time to watch uh, our sermons, our messages, uh, it's maybe because you've developed a habit of watching. Now, you find that you woke up in the morning and I can almost tell you what you did. Number one, of course, you took a shower or a bath. Uh, number two is you brushed your teeth. Number three is you worked on your hair. Number four is you got prepared and dressed up for the day. Now, these are habits that you have developed. It has taken time, but over time, they become part of you. Now, when I was a little boy, um, you know, one of the habits that now I have was bathing. But when I was a little boy, I didn't like bathing. I don't know a child that likes, likes bathing. However, it was so much part of my family. Uh, you know, you, you're taken by force. You keep refusing and refusing and they keep working on you over and over again until they don't even have to be there anymore and I'm doing it and you're doing it right there. I didn't like brushing my teeth when I was little. In fact, the toothpaste was very sweet. I used to eat it sometimes rather than brush my teeth. But guess what? Over and over again, I kept doing it until it became part of me. Now, I can't leave the house without doing it, without brushing my teeth and without brushing my hair. And these are habits we have developed and they are positive habits. And friends, I want to tell you, Daniel had developed a habit of prayer. You see, he could not not pray because Prayer had become part of his identity. It was part of who he was because he had developed a habit of prayer. Now let's look at Jesus Christ. In Luke 4.16, we have a very interesting uh, line here. So he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up 
And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. This tells us that Jesus had a habit. The word custom here is the same word for habit. That he had a habit of entering the synagogue. When? On the Sabbath day. It was a habit that he had. And what was he doing when he got there? He got time to read the word. A habit. Friends, I want to tell you, if you take a habit of reading the word of God, it becomes part of who you are. If you have the habit of maybe like watching the message like you're watching, it becomes part of you. If you have a habit of getting to the synagogue or to the place of worship every Sunday or every time, maybe when there's a time of worship, then that becomes part of you. And then I want us to look at a guy called Paul, Acts 17 2. Acts 17 2. Let's, let's look at Paul. Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them for three Sabbaths, reasoned with them from the scriptures. Now, wait, wait a minute. Even Paul had a habit of meeting people, taking time in the word of God, and discussing with them. I would say it's like having a Bible study. He had a habit of taking time in the word. And let me tell you, friends, we've been having Bible studies, and you need to sign up into a Bible study. And if you're online and it's not possible totally for you to be part of us, then you can actually write us up. You know, uh, you can send a message. And when you do that, we can actually form a little group and take you through online. So you can get down into the time of studying the word. Now, if you look at Luke's, Luke 22, 39 to 40, I want to observe another habit here. Um, uh, just a habit. And I want you to notice this. Now, coming out, he went to the Mount of Olives as he was accustomed it was his habit, and his disciples also followed him. Verse 40. When he came to the place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptations. Friends, a lot of people are in temptations because they don't take time to pray. They have not developed a habit of prayer. No wonder sometimes we find temptations coming our way that should not even come our way. You see, friends, it's an investment in developing a habit of prayer, in developing a habit of seeking God. Is it easy? Not necessarily. Well, Aristotle tells us that, say something, many years ago, he said, we are what we repeatedly do. We are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act, but a habit. Aristotle said, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act, but a habit. What we repeatedly do now, what we repeatedly do is a habit, is a habit. And therefore, as you repeatedly do it, then that becomes part of who you are. Well, in the 1970s, there was a gentleman by the name Noel Bash. Uh, Noel Bash or Bach, um, depending on where you went to school. Now, Noel Bach was an employee with Gordon Training International, and he developed a matrix called the Conscious Competence Ladder. Now, the conscience competence ladder has been used by a lot of people, you know, in just explaining uh, this aspect of con competence. Well, what he actually talked about, what God, what, what um, Noel Bash talked about, he talked about four things. Number one is the unconscious incompetence. Unconscious incompetence is where, uh, you know, one is unskilled, but they do not know that they do not have the skill. They are unskilled, but they do not know that they do not have gained the positive habit of prayer. The positive habit of assembling together in fellowships. The positive habit of joining a Bible study. The positive habit of personal devotions. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we pray. You will help us to develop positive habits. That favor may locate us. For we are walking in excellence. We are not walking in the flesh but in the spirit and conscious competence, living in righteousness and in holiness. For excellence is not an act. Excellence is a habit. Lord, be glorified and be magnified. And right now as you're watching, maybe you're not born again. And you're saying, on my own, I cannot make it. Just say this prayer after me, dear Jesus. I come before you. I ask you to come into my heart. Become my Lord and Savior. Become my king. Become my master. Holy Spirit, fill me now. I belong to Jesus. I'm a new creation. I am willing to move from the place I'm at. And I'm willing to work at it. For it is very true that while salvation is free, then discipleship 
which is a process of sanctification, is a place of working. Give me the grace that I may grow in your purposes and will. In your precious name I pray. Amen. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord equip you. May the Lord prosper you. Have a very productive week. God bless you.